And welcome back to Chemical Principles with your host, uh, the guy with, uh, well, maybe not the most, but guy with some, maybe, I hope. Hey, listen, we've been talking about solutions lately. Uh, solutions always have two components, as you recall. Uh, instead of thinking about solutions in terms of which is higher concentration, which is what a lot of chemistry textbooks teach, what a lot of chemistry professors teach, I like to think of it like this. Um, the solute is kind of like the active ingredient. The solute is the reason that you are choosing the solution. Solvent is the delivery mechanism. It's a solvent that the solute is dissolved in. It's pretty much just that simple. Um, solutions are chosen. We use solutions instead of pure reagents or pure chemicals, whatever you want to think about, for convenience sake. It's easier to measure out uh, two pills than it is to measure out 500 milligrams of acetaminophen. Um, so the important part of solutions, um, and this is, this is really, um, sort of the crux of it, the, the important part of solutions is concentration. The question is, how much solute do we have for giving quantity of solvent? All right, we want to know how many milligrams of acetaminophen, which seems to be my, my example du jour, uh, how many milligrams do we have per teaspoon of the syrup? Um, that is how we know how much of the important stuff, how much of the good stuff we're getting. Um, so there are really two types of concentration units. And I've said this a couple of times, I don't know how, I don't know how clear it is. And we're gonna talk about that today. There are concentration units that are convenient to make, really simple to make in the labs. These concentration units tend to be sort of nightmarish to use in um, calculations. Then there are the concentration units that are easy in calculations, but require more time or calculations to figure out how to make them. So making them in the lab is not so easy, but once you get them in like stoichiometric problems, um, they become almost trivial. Um, as you recall, stoichiometry, you always start with what you're given, convert it to moles. Then for moles, you do your mole to mole ratio and convert back to the units that you want. Well. Calculations, um, in order to get to moles, uh, chemists favorite, a, a, a chemist favorite um, concentration unit, it's a one-step calculation that's simple to get it to moles. Um, I suppose we could throw in a third type of concentration unit. As it turns out, there are some concentration units that come about thermodynamically. There are some concentration units that actually just arise naturally from the laws of nature. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about a few of those as well. So let's get started here and talk about concentrations, different types of concentrations. Um, I'm looking for my pen. Oh, my pen is right here magnetically held on my uh, remarkable two tablet, a little advertisement. Remarkable two. This is a really cool little device. I'm up to 96 pages of notes, um, and at the end, I can just trans transfer it to PDF and just make it available. It's kind of cool. All right, let's start with simple to make. As it turns out, it may be simple to make, but it's a little more complicated than a lot of people might think. What I'm talking about, what I have in mind anyway, is percent. Now, I don't know if anyone has explained this. I feel like I might have talked about it once before in class. 
percent always means per 100. Per means divided by. Divided by. Per. How many per? You know, how many apples per bushel? How many bananas per bunch? Per. Divided by. Cent means 100. Cent means 100. Um, cent cherry, 100 years. Uh, cents, there are 100 cents in a dollar. Um, so cent, centimeter, 100 per meter. Uh, so cent always means 100. Um, but as it turns out, percent units, now, now, there are three types. There, well, there are multiple types of percentages. And sometimes you will see these funny little things. And this, by the way, this is gonna come up here in a second. These are the three main ones. Wait to wait, wait to volume, volume to volume. Um, in a proper percent, denotion, demarcation, and, a, and an appropriate percent. If they give you percent, if it's appropriate, they will give you WW or WV or V to V, uh, which means either weight to weight, weight to volume, or volume to volume. For example, let's take weight to volume. Weight to weight, weight to volume means weight of solute Volume means total volume of the solution. Notice this is total volume, which means it is the volume of the solute plus solvent. This matters. Um, and any time you see volume in a percent calculation, it is always volume of the entire solution. Weight, the weight on the bottom here, that is also the weight of the solution. So, Suppose you have, oh, I'm going to show you, uh, by the way, I'm going to show you dilution calculations. I'm going to give you a real simple little formula. I don't like giving formulas, but this particular one is very useful and very simple. Um, so we're going to talk about dilutions as well. So if you have a saline solution, Like in contact lenses, by the way, SLN, shorthand, chemist shorthand for solution. Just like RXN, reaction, SLN, solution. So saline is um, from a song, saline, saline, oh, yeah, sorry, it's like a joke, it's just smaller. Saline is sodium chloride. Um, and if you want to make a saline solution, and if memory serves, now I don't wear contacts. These are actually readers. Um, I don't have prescription eyeglasses. I'm fortunate that way for a man my age in advancing years. As old as I am, I don't have any prescription glasses. I feel left out. So I am lucky. Um, <clears throat> but you want something that's iso isotonic, I think is the name, iso isotonic. Your cells have a certain percent of water in them. And you want a solution 
uh, that has the right concentration, the right saline concentration, so that water doesn't go into the cells, causing them to inflate to the point where they could rupture, or water is drawn out of the cells, causing them to shrink. Um, honey is basically a sugar solution, a sugar mixture, but we don't refrigerate it. And it doesn't really make sense if you don't think about it. Um, when you think about it, because, you know, things eat sugar, bacteria eat sugar, microbes eat sugar. So why do we just leave it out on the counter to let mold grow uh, and bacteria and all kinds of things like that? Have you ever seen mold on honey? Honey is such a high concentration that it literally draws moisture out of any cell, any microbe, any bacteria, anything that comes in contact with that sugar instantly becomes dehydrated and dies. That's why honey doesn't have to be uh, refrigerated. That's why we don't have to worry about it. There's also a very interesting um, and dangerous. I actually knew someone who had suffered from this and survived it. Uh, something called hyponatremia. Uh, hyponatremia is often found in runners who drink too much water. <clears throat> this man drank too much water. Uh, there was a uh, story of a radio contest. And radio got sued enormously and lost because their doctor recommended that the contest was this or some big prize. I don't know what it was. Uh, and they had everyone sitting around a, a table, a um, picnic table, all the contestants. And they had to drink a certain amount of water per hour without getting up. Uh, first, you know, Last one to get up, because, you know, you're trying to get it, so they have to go to the bathroom really desperately. Um, last one to get up wins. The doctor suggested that instead of water, they should use some sort of a sports drink that has, you know, built-in um, electrolytes. Electrolytes are just like regular electrodes, but they have one-third fewer calories. <laughs> it's a like a joke. You've been watching my earlier earlier videos, you know, electrolytes are just salts like sodium chloride. Well, what happens is the percent water in your system, the percent water in your veins becomes so high, the concentration of your blood gets so low that basically it forces water into cells. Hyponatremia is caused when the cells in the brain absorb too much water, hypo, low. Natremia, I always think Na, that's the atomic symbol for sodium, so it's low sodium. What happens is your brain cells start to inflate to the point where they might just burst. Um, it was down to a man and a woman. The woman was complaining of headaches. And eventually she passed out and died from hyponatremia. She had too much water, not enough electrolytes. The balance was off. Um, so if you're gonna put saline, if you're gonna put your contacts in a solution, you want the proper saline solution so that you don't cause problems in the cells in your eyes. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, which I may not be, check your bottles. Saline solution is typically 0.05% saline weight to volume. 0.05% weight to volume. Well, as it turns out, with the density of water, one milliliter is one gram. So how do you make 0.05%? Well, it means 0.05 grams. Take 0.05 grams of your sodium chloride 
and add it to 100 milliliters of water. Now, because we're talking about a percent, every time you make a percent, you multiply by 100. And that's it. A very simple calculation, very simple thing to do. Horrible in chemical calculations. Now, at low concentrations, this works well. Uh, the volume, you always take the volume to be 100 milliliters and the weight in grams. And of course, this can scale. If you want one liter, for example, if you want one liter, so it's 0 0.05 grams per 100 milliliters. If you want one liter, one liter is 1,000 milliliters. It is 10 times larger than 100. So if you want a liter of 0.05%, you're going to take 0 0.5 grams. You multiply the bottom by 10, you multiply the top by 10, 0 0.5 grams per 1,000 times 100, and you'll get the same thing, 0.05%. Let's talk real quick about dilutions. Sometimes we talk, talk about stock solutions. All right. A stock solution is always higher concentration than you want. It's always higher concentration than you want. Here's a couple different reasons you might do this. First of all, sometimes it's not so easy to measure out uh, 0.05 grams of sodium chloride. So you might make, make stock solutions which are higher concentration to make it easier to work with the equipment that we have. The other thing is because they're higher concentration, they take up less room. So you can make up a stock solution and then dilute it down into what you need um, and take up less space on your shelf as you do it. So for example, in our previous example, we wanted 0.05% sodium chloride. But the problem is if we made enough 0.05% sodium chloride for the entire class, we're going to take up a lot of shelf space in the stock room. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to make a simple solution that can be diluted down every time we have a lab. So we might make a stock solution of say 5%. much higher concentration. Easy to make, again, five grams. Or actually, let's do this. We're gonna take 50 grams of sodium chloride and put it in 1,000 milliliters or one liter. Do the calculation and you'll see it comes out to be a 5% solution. So now the question becomes, how do we do the dilution? How do we do the dilution down to what we want? Well, there's a very simple little formula. Every time I see this in a textbook, they use different letters. Uh, it doesn't really matter what letter you use. The, the, this is what I call it. C1, V1 equals C2, V2. I always used to have my students memorize that. Of course, a lot of my students were pre-med or pre-nursing. Uh, Nursing is medicine as well. But um, 
It's a real simple little formula to remember. And the beauty is, as long as you are consistent in your units, it doesn't matter what units you use. So you can use percentage and gallons if you want, but you have to use percentage and gallons throughout. Very simple calculation. C always stands for concentration. It does not matter what concentration you, you, unit you want. Concentration, percent. Uh, we're going to learn concentration called molarity, molality, which is another one, uh, mole fraction. Uh, there's a whole slew of concentration units available out there. V is volume in liters and milliliters and gallons and pints and quarts. It doesn't matter. Any, any type of volume unit you want. Like I say, just be con consistent. Quartz on one side, quartz on the other side. One means your initial or stock solution, your initial concentration. And two means your desired or final. Let's do this in English. So in the above solution, we have 5% sodium chloride as our stock solution. Suppose we want 750 milliliters. Oops. So then we went to the next page. Suppose we want 750 milliliters of 0.05% sodium chloride that we're going to be using in an experiment. We have 5%. How do we make it? Well, our initial concentration is 5%. Our desired volume, our final volume, what we want, the final volume is 750 milliliters. And our desired concentration it's 0.05%. You will always have three of these four. You will always be missing one. So the calculation becomes pretty straightforward. We have 5%. Now, I always put the units down to remind myself that we are being consistent in the units. If you get milliliter uh, percent on one side and you get molarity on the other, you realize, you look at it, it's like, wait, that's not right. They look different. We do not know the initial volume. But we do know we want a final concentration of 0.05%, and we want 750 milliliters of it. Let's put a decimal point there just for sig figs. We'll only have one sig fig in the end. Why do we only have one sig fig? This is one sig fig. Remember in significant figures, anything preceding the first non-zero number is not significant. It's important, it's important because we need 0 0.05, not 0 0.5. It's important, not significant. The percentages cancel. We are left, we notice we are going to be left with milliliters. Uh, let's see, that's going to be 0 0.01, 7.5 milliliters. 7.5 milliliters. Did I do that right? Yes, I did. All right. What is this telling us? This is telling us that if we take 7.5 milliliters of our original stock solution, 
We take 7.5 milliliters of our original stock solution and dilute it up to a total of 750 milliliters. We will have our desired 0 0.05 milliliters. We're going to take 7.5, dilute it up to 750. That will give us 0 0.05. Now, if you want, you can take it one step further. If you have a graduated cylinder, you just add water until it goes up to 750 and you're done. If you want, you can take seven and a half milliliters of your solution and add water. Well, how much water should you add? Well, we need a total of 750, but 7.5 milliliters is our stock solution. So we will end up adding 742.5 milliliters of water. So if you want, you can figure out how much solvent you need to add by subtracting the amount of, of stock solution from the final volume. So this is the, the stock solution we're going to take. Just divide it and subtract it from the total volume. That'll tell you how much water you're adding. Uh, the easiest way, get a graduated cylinder, measure it up to 750, and you're done. Or... If you're trying to be more precise, chemistry in, in labs, we have far more precise instruments than this. We have burettes. Uh, well, we're not, we use a burette for this. We'd have pipettes, which will give us exactly 7.500 milliliters. We have, uh, we have, um, <laughs> what is the name of those? Wow, have I been out of the lab for way too long? Anyway, we have these volumetric flasks, ha, call it a volumetric flask, that will measure it up to exactly 750.00 milliliters. So you can do this with real precision in the chemistry lab. Um, I was about to say something, I guess it does. Oh, uh, things are not always this works really well for dilute solutions. If solutions are very concentrated, it will mess it up. So you're talking about total volume, which means sometimes you add a different amount. You don't add this much water. For example, if you take 50 milliliters of ethanol, this is drinking alcohol, and add it to 50 milliliters, this is a 50% volume to volume solution. <clears throat> you would think, you would think this is 50% volume to volume. Add it to 50 milliliters of water, and what do you think you would get? When you add the two together, you should get 100 milliliters out of it, but you don't. What happens is, <clears throat> <clears throat> the attractive forces between um, the water and the ethanol are so strong. It's hydrogen bonding. I mean, we have here hydrogen bonded directly to an oxygen. So we have hydrogen bonding. Those intermolecular forces are so strong that the water and the, and the ethanol actually pull each other more tightly together than either pure ethanol or pure water. They're just so happy. It's because they're all the molecules are drunk, man. They're having a party. So they're way too close. You know how, you know, someone is a little too tipsy it tends to get a little too into your face. You know what I'm talking about? They're a little too affectionate. Yeah, thank you. No. Um, anyway, add these together, you end up with a total volume of only 95 milliliters. 95 milliliters. So in truth, what you have is 50 milliliters of ethanol in 95 milliliters of solution. And what you actually end up with, if I can find my calculator, is roughly 52.6. 
ethanol, which would be closer to 105 proof rather than 100 proof. Um, proof is always twice. Proof is always twice volume to volume. Uh, proof is another odd little um, concentration unit. Only applies to drinking alcohol. Proof is twice the percentage. Uh, what they used to do was, uh, you know, back in colonial days, they knew distillation, but it was a very dangerous process because they didn't have good control. They didn't have good firefighting, you know, techniques and control. The very first firefighting department was developed by Benjamin Franklin, and they were not tasked with putting out fires. Their job was to run into fires and pick up and take out as much personal property as they can um, to try and save it for the victim of the fire. The house would burn down. But the problem is not only would the house burn down, but sometimes it would start other houses on fire. And all of a sudden you'd have an entire village that burned down. The old, uh, the old legend of how Chicago burned down because Bessie the cow kicked over a lantern. Um, that's apocryphal. I don't believe it actually happened, but maybe, you know, because that did happen back then. So <clears throat> England <clears throat> had all the stills because the uh, Americans didn't want to distill anything because of the dangers involved. So they would uh, ship in alcohol. The captains would realize if you add water to your stock, you get more to sell, which means you make more money. The colonists began demanding proof that the alcohol was not watered down before buying it. They put a little bit of gunpowder on the uh, <clears throat> deck of the ship and they douse it in alcohol, light it on fire. If the gunpowder burned, it was considered 100% proof that the ethanol has not been watered down. Uh, well, it turns out the gunpowder would burn at 50% alcohol. So 50% became 100 proof. And that's where that comes from. So, okay, so percentages, and, and by the way, you add a lot of salt, that 5% salt will actually contract the water volume a little bit. 5% uh, is still a low enough concentration. If you're doing precise work, that would mess you up. So the total volume would actually not be 100. Um, but for typical, for most day-to-day you know, -day use, it's, it's not going to make a significant difference. So percentage is really easy to use in calculations. I'm sorry, in, in the lab, you just put them together and it's just trivial. But <clears throat> in calculations, they're rather more complicated uh, because to do a calculation with percent uh, you need to know the uh, I'm sorry. You need to know the density of the solution. To get the density of the solution, you can convert from the volume of the solution to the mass of the solution, uh, which then can be converted to moles, and uh, it's it's a much more complicated kind of a kind of a thing. So for example, if you're doing a calculation that actually was 50% ethanol instead of 52.6, you'd have to get the density to figure out how many grams are actually in that 52.6%, how many grams of ethanol, then you can convert to moles. So it's, it's just, it's an icky, icky calculation. So if you want to do calculations that are easier using in, um, concentrations using easier calculations. The chemist's favorite concentration unit is molarity. Sometimes given this symbol capital M with a line underneath it, 
A lot of times people don't bother with the line, so it's just capital M on it. Molarity is moles of solute. per liter of solution. Moles of solute per liter of solution. It's a little more complicated to make these things. But suppose I wanted a one molar solution of silver nitrate, and I want 100 milliliters. I want to make 100 milliliters of silver nitrate. Well, in order to do that, boy, did I choose a complex, complex example here. Okay, we need the molar mass. And to make a note, in this case, we're not talking about doing the calculation. We're talking about making the solution much more challenging to make the solution because I'm going to need the molar mass of our silver nitrate. Silver has a formula mass. If you look on your periodic chart, uh, we're gonna we're gonna round here. We're gonna say 108. It's actually 107.9. Eh, today we're gonna round. Nitrogen is 14 grams per mole. Remember, always add grams per mole to your formula masses. And oxygen, of course, is 16 grams per mole. But don't forget to multiply that by three. So silver nitrate I am not going to do this calculation for you. I'm going to let you do it as practice. You should be getting a total of 170 grams per mole. 170 grams per mole. Now, when you are given molarity as concentration units, don't leave it as a capital M. To use factory label, we need units that will cancel. So always remember molarity is moles per liter. That's what you need, not molarity, moles per liter. Molarity is shorthand. So always remember, it is moles per liter. So how do we make one molar silver nitrate? Well, our final volume is going to be 100 milliliters. And when we do our factor label, that's what we're going to have to start with. Now, notice we have milliliters here, liters down here. So we need to convert from milliliters to liter, but one liter is 1,000 milliliters. That is a simple conversion. Gives us 0 0.1 liters is what that will give us. Your 170 grams of silver nitrate per mole not per mole, yeah. And what do we get? 16 tons. And we're another day older, deeper in debt. All right. Uh, sorry, bad joke. So we end up with 16 grams. I'm sorry, 17. 17 grams. Why did I say 16? Oh, because it's 16 tons. Sorry. Okay, my joke interfered. I apologize. It's 17. If, if you want to complain, I will refund your money. Okay. So we end up with 17 grams. What is this telling us? This is telling us if we measure out 17 grams of silver nitrate and put it in 100 milliliters of water, has to be really pure water, has to be really clean glassware, or you end up with this cloudy solution. We want to clear 
but if you do that, you will end up with one mole per liter of silver nitrate. One more. Well, now the calculations become simple. We don't need density for this. So we made one molar solution. Suppose we take three, 3.7 milliliters of our silver nitrate and react it with copper. I want to know how many grams of silver will I get out? How many grams of silver will I get out? Well, now the calculation becomes almost trivial. And we are supposed to be taking a break now. I want to take a break right after this example. Remember, moles is mole per liter. And we cannot do calculation stoichiometry without a balanced equation. So our balanced equation We've talked about this reaction before. This is the silver Christmas tree. The solution starts out clear and colorless. Um, as the solution turns blue, because of the silver nitrate, as the solution turns blue, you get a silver tree, kind of silver crystals forming on the copper wire. It's beautiful. Uh, so here's our balanced equation. We know we have 3.7 milliliters of our solution. Now, we can't use it directly because molarity is liters, but it's a very easy conversion. if I put it in the right way. Remember, you want the units to cancel. So milliliters always goes on the, well, goes on the bottom in this case, so the milliliters cancel. Actually, we can cancel out nitrate too. Now we throw in our molarity. So we're already at moles. We didn't need density. We didn't need to convert from, you know, it's, it's, it's just a very simple calculation. Uh, and finally, we just put in our mole to mole value ratio. Oops, we're gonna need to do one more step though because we don't want moles. We want grams. I apologize, I ran out of space here, so it continues down here. Do the calculation real quick. And we end up with no, not much at all. Oh, I think I did that wrong. Try that again. Always look at your final solution and see if it makes sense. I think I divided by 108 instead of multiplying. That makes much more sense. We're going to end up with not quite half a gram of pure silver by the time we're done. So molarity, very easy to use in calculations, unless you may have to convert the volume. But aside from that one step, and you're at moles, and that's exactly the first step that you want in the stoichiometric calculation. It is 1045. I'm going to take a break. You can take a break. Uh, let's meet back here at 1050. Oops, wrong mouse.
I will see you in five. Hi there. Okay. Um, I've been wondering if there's something else I should talk about in this chapter. So I decided to go ahead and actually refer to my textbook, which usually I don't do, but a lot of the stuff in this chapter we've covered previously, which is why we're not covering it now. Um, they talk about dissociation and uh, electrolytes. Um, we talked about total and ionic concentrations and spectator ions, and we've talked about all that stuff before. So we're not covering that again. We've already done it. Uh, naturally, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to ask. But uh, there's one thing I've been debating in my head for quite some time now, and that is when to talk about something called the colligative properties. Those are covered in this chapter. Um, and it is appropriate to cover it in this chapter. It would also be appropriate to cover it in the next chapter, thermodynamics. Um, since they cover it in my textbook, and I don't know about your textbook because you may not be using the same one, but in my textbook, it's covered in this chapter. So we're going to talk about collective properties for a little bit. I don't think we'll be doing a lot of calculations. We might, but I doubt it. Colligative properties are properties of solutions that are dependent on the concentration, but independent as to the identity of the solute. So they are solutions, properties of the solution, dependent on calculation, on concentration, but not dependent on the identity of the solute. In other words, if you have two solutions of the same concentration, we're gonna have the same colligative properties. Doesn't matter what the solute is. One might be sugar, the other might be calcium nitrate, it doesn't matter. If they're the same concentration, and there's a caveat to this, we're going to talk about that as well. But if they're the same concentration, they're going to be the same properties. Now, there are three major colligative properties that we talk about. Let's first talk about, well, winter is nigh upon us. So let's talk about the one that you're familiar with. Freezing point depression. Solutions always freeze at a lower temperature than pure solvent. Always, always, always. Never an exception. They always freeze at a lower temperature than the pure solvent. So why do you spread ice? Why do you spread salt on ice? And why is it that it only works if it's not too bitterly cold? Well, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a solution. You have water in its frozen form on your steps causing problems because it's slick. It's slippery. We don't want that. So we put salt on top of it so it tastes better. <laughs> it's like a joke. <laughs> Smile. Anyway, so we put salt on top of it, and we're trying to make a solution of the frozen, of the water in the ice with the salt. So the salt will begin to kind of dissolve down into the ice, creating a solution. And because of colligative properties, 
the freezing point of that salt water solution is lower than the freezing point of water. So here's what happens. Water has this freezing point here. The temperature, the outside temperature drops and drops and drops and eventually reaches the freezing point of water and typically have to go a little beyond because it's not pure to begin with. So all of a sudden, the temperature reaches a point where that water will freeze and it goes a little bit lower. So what do you do? You add salt and you make a solution. You make a salt water solution. And the freezing point all of a sudden goes from that of pure water to something lower. Well, now the temperature is above the freezing point of the new solution. And the ice melts. That's a colligative property. But notice it still has a freezing point. So if it's really bitterly cold, that temperature outside can still be lower than the solution. So that's why the salt sometimes does not work. Um, freezing point depression. So that's the first colligative property. The second colligative property is related. Boiling point elevation. When you are cooking your pasta, most people will put salt in the water. And let me make this very clear to you. Let me make this very clear to you. A lot of people, there's an old wives' tale out there that you add salt to the water to make it boil faster. No. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Not just inaccurate, but flawed. Adding salt to the water does not make the water boil faster. Because boiling point elevation just like freezing point depression. The boiling point of water is here. And what do you do? You put it on the stove until the water, until the temperature goes up and up and up and up. And once that temperature reaches the boiling point, it stops. That temperature of that water will not go any higher once it starts boiling. That's because all of the excess energy that we're putting into the water is no longer going to raising the temperature. Now that excess energy is going into boiling, converting the water from liquid to gas. All right? That's why when you're boiling a liquid, the temperature is fixed. Water boils 100 degrees Celsius, period. And that's where the temperature stays. But because of colligative properties, you add salt to the water. Two peanuts are walking down the road. One is assaulted. <laughs> like a joke, <laughs> but I look stupid. Anyway, you add salt to the water, what happens? Well, because of this colligative property, the boiling point of the water of the solution, <clears throat> pardon my voice, puberty now, the boiling point of the solution is now higher than 100 degrees Celsius. The boiling point has raised, which means the temperature is going to again begin to increase until again it reaches that boiling point. So if you add salt to water, it actually will take longer for the water to boil because it has to reach a higher temperature. So adding salt to water does not make the water boil faster. In fact, if anything, it slows it down. But now your pasta is being cooked at a higher temperature. So what does happen is that the pasta will cook faster because it's actually at a higher temperature. Boiling point elevation. And again, always, boiling point always increases. If you make a solution, it will always increase. And I want to point this out to you. This is kind of an interesting caveat. Maybe this is a gift from God. I don't know. It's a really interesting kind of a thing. But consider this. The liquid phase for water, well, for any solvent actually, 
anything, any liquid. The liquid phase is a very narrow band between the freezing point and the boiling point. You can have any temperature it wants down to absolute zero and still be a solid. You can have any temperature it wants up to the critical point, which we're not going to talk about. It's beyond the scope of this course. And you're going to have a gas or a vapor. That's your Mick Jagger, in which case it's a gas, gas, gas. And there is a difference between gas or vapor. But that, again, is beyond the scope of this course. And it has to do with the critical temperature. The liquid is a very narrow band of temperatures. But you make a solution out of it, and two things are going to happen. First of all, your freezing point is going to lower. You get a lower freezing point. And you get a higher boiling point. So in essence, when you have a solution, you have expanded that band you not only freeze at a lower temperature, but you also boil at a higher temperature. So your liquid band goes up and down and just becomes wider. There used to be a commercial for an antifreeze. Antifreeze is, is uh, ethylene glycol. Keep your ethylene glycol, keep your antifreeze away from children, keep it away from pets. And animals keep it well sealed on a high shelf because it tastes sweet and it is toxic. Um, so you add antifreeze to your radiator and the maximum colligative property you can get is 50-50. 50% ethanol, I'm oh, sorry, 50% ethylene glycol, 50% water. Doesn't matter what the solvent is, you could use something other than ethylene glycol. We use ethylene glycol because it doesn't evaporate readily. So we could use anything, honestly. I don't really know all of the reasons why we use ethylene glycol and not sugar. Don't put sugar in your engine. But if you start, well, ethylene glycol is a liquid itself, so it's not going to crystallize. If you start getting sugar too high a concentration and starts crystallizing in your lines, it's you're going to blow up your engine, so don't add sugar. But we add its antifreeze. Why is it antifreeze? Because now we have a solution of water and ethylene glycol. So the, the freezing point drops, makes it less likely for your engine to freeze when it gets cold out. It's antifreeze, prevents it from freezing. And it prevents it from freezing because of the collective property. It'll still freeze if it gets really too cold. It'll still have that fuel line free. Of course, this isn't fuel line, but it can still freeze. It's just that it has to be a really, really low temperature. And this one particular brand of antifreeze said, hey, not only do we keep your, your engine from freezing up in the winter, we also keep it from overheating in the summer. Woo Every antifreeze does that, every single one of them, because not only in the solution, not only do you drop the freezing point of water of the, of the salt of the solution, you also raise the boiling point, which means it's not going to overheat either. So yes, they got to say it because they were the first one to advertise this, but it's just, it's an accidental fact. Not only does antifreeze keep your, your engine from freezing up in the winter, it also keeps it from overheating in the summer. Um, it's just a collective property. That's all there is to it. Speaking of concentration units, I said that there were some units that arise naturally from thermodynamics. And this is what I'm talking about. They're really simple. You can derive this using the laws of thermodynamics. The change of the freezing point
and the change in the freezing point and the of the boiling point. Now notice this delta, this means change in. So you do this calculation, you're not going to come up with instead of 100, it's going to be 103. It's changing, which means that the, this, this calculation will give you three. So the new value, the new boiling point is going to be the original boiling point plus three from this equation. KB and KF, we're going to talk about I a little bit in a moment. But KB and KF are constants, the boiling point, except I have them backwards. F stands for, this should be B down here, because this is freezing, it should be F up here, my apologies. Anyway, it's, it's just the freezing point constant, the boiling point constant. It depends on the, the solvent. So for water, KF is always the same. Doesn't matter what the solute is, KB is always the same. M is one of those concentration units that I told you comes about naturally from thermodynamics. It is called molality. It is a very unusual <clears throat> concentration unit. It is moles of solute per kilogram, not of solution, of solvent. Very hard to work with in easy to make it. Well, it's kind of hard to make it in the lab because you have to convert grams to moles. Hard to work with in calculations because you have kilograms of solvent instead of kilograms of solution. But in these calculations, it's just it comes about naturally. This is this is uh, this is the equation that just falls out of thermodynamics. If you know the molality, these are very simple calculations to do. Now I told you this. I told well. Yeah, let's do this now. And then there's one more collective property we've not spoken about yet. Let's talk about that I. I told you it does not matter what the solute is. So when we go out to melt show, to melt uh, ice in the winter. Why can't we use sugar? If we have the same concentration of sugar, we're going to get the same freezing point depression. So sugar will melt your steps. It's not gonna harm your grass, it's just sugar. Well now compare that to, we're gonna, Remember our when we talked about the total and net ionic con, ionic solution. Compare this to calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is an ionic compound, which means it dissociates in water. Which means you don't have calcium chloride floating around. Sugar cannot dissociate. You have sugar molecules. Calcium chloride will dissociate into calcium ions and two chloride ions. So it doesn't matter, remember, colligative properties, it does not matter what the solute is. Calcium and the chloride both act as solute in this sort of a situation in, in ionic compounds. So what ends up happening is, we would say that the value of I is one for sugar because it cannot dissociate. It remains a single unit. But calcium chloride will break up from one unit to three. So the concentration of the calcium chloride will act as if it is three times higher than the concentration of the, if it stayed together, okay? So what ends up happening is 0.1 moles of sugar will not be as effective 
as 0.1 moles of calcium chloride because 0.1 moles of calcium chloride will act more like 0.3. It'll be three times higher because it breaks up into these different ions. So when your kid is working on these calculations, these are really simple. You take the molality times a constant. But when your kids are working on these calculations, remember that this I basically corresponds with how many components the solute will break up into. And it deals with the effectiveness of the effectiveness of the solute in these colligative properties. We have about 10 minutes left. Let's talk about the last colligative property, which is actually kind of related to the boiling point elevation, but it is different. Vapor pressure depression. If you take a solvent and put it in a closed system, we're going to hook it up to a manometer, which means we're going to put a little bit of mercury in here. The mercury allows us to measure the pressure of the system. This solvent will begin to evaporate until it reaches a steady state. And we'll talk about that in the, in the later chapter. So you're gonna have some vapor and some liquid. And what's gonna happen is the amount of water in the vapor phase is gonna be zero at the beginning and slowly begin to rise until it maximizes itself. So the pressure inside here is going to rise. How much that pressure rises because of the liquid is the vapor pressure, okay? How much the pressure rises because of the liquid is the vapor pressure. Well, if you put a solute in there, remember in true solutions, there's an attractive force between the solvent and the solute, which means that solute is gonna grab that water and hold it tighter because it doesn't wanna give up on it. It wants to keep the water with it. It wants to hold on to it. So there's when the solvent, I'm sorry, when the solute is holding on to the solvent, you're not going to have as much vapor up here. If you don't have as much vapor, the vapor pressure drops. Hence, vapor pressure depression. The attractive forces between the solvent and the solute hold the water in its liquid form which drops the pressure of the vapor, drops the vapor pressure. Now here is something that's gonna blow your mind. When do liquids boil? Most people will tell you that liquids boil when the temperature reaches the boiling point, which is kind of correct, but ultimately not quite accurate. What happens is this, if you have a liquid, if you have some water on the stove, I'm gonna make one of my favorite meals today. I'm gonna to make uh, mac and cheese with sausage. So I'm going to be boiling water for my macaroni. What happens? Well, you start off with liquid at some given temperature, okay, tap water, and you add heat to it. So the temperature begins to rise. Well, what ends up happening is vapor pressure is a function of temperature. The higher the temperature, and if you think about this, it kind of makes sense, because the higher the temperature, the more vapor you're gonna create. So vapor pressure goes up. As the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. All right? Water boils when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. This is important for a reason I'm about to delineate, but you add water in the vapor, so your vapor, your, your atmospheric pressure is here. You add heat to your water and the vapor pressure of the water, which is an intrinsic property. The vapor pressure begins to rise. 
and you're getting hot water, hot water, hot water, and all of a sudden the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. That's when the water boils, when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Now you add a solute to this, like, like salt, and that vapor pressure drops a little bit. In order to get that vapor pressure back up to atmospheric pressure, you have to add more heat. So again, boiling point elevation. It's now boiling at a higher temperature. Here's something that's going to blow your mind. Remember your grandma's pressure cooker? Very dangerous devices. These days, I have a pressure cooker downstairs. These days, they have computerized pressure cookers. It automatically locks and unlocks when you can and cannot open the lid. And it cooks food much more quickly than on the stove. Well, what's happening? What's happening is if you have a pressure cooker, the atmosphere inside the pressure cooker, it's a sealed system. It doesn't know that it's a sealed system. So all it knows is that the atmospheric pressure, the pressure inside the pressure cooker is now higher than outside of the pressure cooker. So the liquid says, oh, look, the atmospheric pressure is up here, not here anymore. It's a much higher atmospheric pressure. So in order to boil, again, that water will vapor pressure. You'll have to add more heat. The vapor pressure of the liquid will go up, and now it's boiling at an even higher pressure because it's trying to equilibrate the vapor pressure of the liquid with the internal pressure of the pressure cooker. In biology, they have devices that are called, ah, they're used for distillation, actually they use it in, in hospitals too. Um, God, my mind is just shot today. Shoot, okay, I can't think of the name of it, but basically it works on the same principle. It's a big pressure cooker. Uh, these things, they put their instruments in there for sterilization, they put a little bit of water in there and they heat it up and they keep it closed. Um, sterilization instrument. What's it called, Google? All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Shoot, I can't find it. Where is it? Well, that's disappointing. Okay. Anyway, every once in a while, these things explode. <laughs> Autoclaves, autoclaves, that's it, the autoclave. Okay, autoclaves explode. But they explode because they're being used incorrectly. So an autoclave is nothing but a really big, extra high pressure pressure cooker. It's just like what you have in your kitchen if you have a pressure cooker in the kitchen. It's just that it's designed for higher pressures. Higher internal pressures means it's good that water is going to boil at an even higher temperature, which is going to sterilize more effectively. When an autoclave explodes, it's because someone decides to put a solvent in there like alcohol, something flammable. Um, you have, if you have a diesel engine, there are no spark plugs in the diesel engine. What happens is the pressure and the temperature of the piston compresses the gas, the, the uh, diesel fuel so tightly that it just automatically explodes. So it doesn't need the spark plug. Same thing happens. In an autoclave, if you add something like ethanol, a flammable organic solvent, any flammable organic solvent, the pressure and the temperature is going to get so high that it's going to go off, just like a diesel 
cylinder. So these are your colligative properties. Next time we're going to talk about thermodynamics, which is sort of one of my favorite topics, and I may go off onto some tangents there. But I hope you've learned something. I hope you had a lot of fun. It is by my clock, 1120. So I am out of here.